You are listening to Keystone's Stock Talk Show, episode 197. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at www.keystocks.com. Come back often, and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or on iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Keystocks and on Facebook, and keep submitting your stocks via the usual social channels or at our website, keystocks.com, for our Your Stock Our Take segment. And we just might review your stock in an upcoming show and let you know if it is a buy, sell, or hold. After a week off to attend one of our biggest conferences of the year, we are happy to be back with you again this week, kicking off February, or as Brennan likes to call it, his month of love. We will look back at our presentations at the World Outlook in Vancouver and the weekend that was. I will take a small excerpt from my speech and discuss the 2022 and current broader market valuations from a historical perspective. Brennan hits the mailbag to answer a Your Stock, Our Take question on Atlas Engineered Products, AEP on the TSX Venture, a profitable growing small cap that is acquiring and operating profitable, well-established operations in Canada's trust and engineering products sector. Uh, from a current valuation and growth perspective, the, there's a good deal to like about the business. Brennan goes over the details. Aaron will be doing an educational segment on EBITDA versus net income. And finally, Brett will give a summary of the trouble facing the now former third richest man in the world, Gautam Adani, and his company, the Adani Group, which have been accused by or short seller Hindenburg Group of fraud. I welcome my co-host Aaron and the Killer Bees, Brett and Brennan. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Nice doing to be well. back after a busy weekend. Good, good. Yep. Yeah, for sure. It was a good weekend. Uh, myself and Brennan, well, at least part of my arm, I think. Maybe uh, tomorrow morning or it could be today, depending on when this drops. But February the 8th, uh, dependent on, again, when the show is dropped, we'll be ringing in the opening bell on the TSX. So that's pretty cool. We taped that over this weekend at the World Outlook. So you may see my arm or part of my but body. But Brennan's going to be visible in the video. Beautiful face. I mean, I'm in the believe. background, but uh, you're, yeah. so you're, you're I was in the front row, but off the to the side. By yourself. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. all Brennan. Yeah, basically. Bringing yeah, in the bell. What an honor. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to push my way to the front, but, you know, people were like, get back. There. So the ringing of the bell was actually knocking the bell over and it falling on the ground. And... Oh, no. Is Brennan no. getting his bell rung by somebody in the crowd after he said something inappropriate? That's what really no, happened. No. no. No, it was great. We were at the World Outlook Conference this week again. Uh, great to see everyone in person shaking hands. We literally shook hands with, you know, probably 100 clients, 100 plus hundreds of clients. Um it was great. There's about just under a thousand rabid and engaged in investors. Um, a thousand plus apparently watch it online. So there's you know a diverse set of views from the speakers there, ranging from a prediction of World War Three to the next bull run starting you know today. So uh, a wide range of views, but it was great to see clients, potential new clients, and. Uh, you guys in person, that was well, speak for yourself. You know, that yeah, was, and that a, was wonderful. It's actually, Ryan, a common fantastic. theme that I had in my conversations was the you know clients and podcast listeners were coming up to me and they were like, "Why the heck do the guys rag on you so much?" I don't you know, even and think that, was that, a common that I theme. do personally, but yeah, there's some guys. I mean, Aaron does. So they're ready but, to uh, you know take me out right there. Brett, at the and, conference. Brett and Ryan have been you know, piling on. Uh, yeah, there was several people. It's weird. I had the exact office said, please dig <laughs> the keys in a little deeper into Brennan. <laughs> You're not going too far. And when I said, I'm well, sure. you know, we can try. We can try. I'm so, sure. you know, like I said, a diverse set of views across the board. I got hate right? mail like from right people. There. Leave Brennan alone. Yeah, for Brennan. <laughs> He's a nice young He's man. Alone. Yeah, he, he he is a nice young man. That's too. And we had we had Brett out there for your first time. Uh, how was that getting out in front of the people for the first time? Oh yeah, no, no, it, it was great. The only uh, uh, I complained I would have is uh, for some reason that they let these two uh, clowns on stage for about forty minutes. Uh, one one of them was like an author, and one was saying AI was going to take over the world. Really? What but, were their names? Uh, no, no, no. I don't think I, I caught that one. Uh, 
Oh, I, I think it was like Aaron. Think about Aaron, your, your Aaron future Irvine. career before you. Yeah. Aaron, it was like Aaron <laughs> Irvine and uh, Ryan Dunn, something like that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Those guys are clowns. No, for it was good. His last, his last episode. Yeah, last podcast. Uh, I'll, I'll, so yeah. No, his first I'll, and I'll last time one. at that conference, right? Yeah. yeah sure. You don't <laughs> have to worry, Brett. You're <laughs> never gonna see it again. So. <laughs> uh, no, it was cool. Yeah. They they ran a good event. Uh, Grant and Nina and Annabelle and the, the whole crew. Michael, of course, is is very welcoming to the whole crowd. Mm-hmm. Um, Victor Adair, of course, helped helped out as well. And uh, he, I saw him at the reception getting fed. Um, what was it? Lamb lollipops, and he was he was going to town on them. He had a good time. No, Victor's a good guy. We went to a speaker dinner after myself and Aaron, which went very long and it was very fun right we had a good time yep yep it's lovely and you guys went to a reception as well well, I, well we we were there for most of the time as well and, uh, do you have a good time yeah. brennan anything to oh, report yeah. from that reception <laughs> no no just time, that right? yeah it was a great time and you know they were serving crab and i know that brett was a little bit bitter because he uh, oh, yeah. spent <laughs> all the time breaking off this one crab leg off of this full crab the prize leg and right yeah the, the prize <laughs> leg and then all of a sudden they started saying okay we're gonna be ringing the bell here for you know the the tsx open here so we, we all, all kind of gathered over. around and moved away from the table and brett came back to the table to to witness grant <laughs> eating the crab leg Ooh. that he, he had worked no 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 for. i i don't oh, know if he got it but they were at the right table <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I'm a bit salty about the You're calling out, you're calling out, Brett, uh, I, I, I don't know if it was Grant or anyone else, but I see no. Brennan calling out Grant and uh, I, like, the next <laughs> don't put it on me, it was, or, or maybe roll come on, Brennan, <laughs> here we go again, eh? Yeah, we can. <laughs> uh, so no, it was a good event and, um, there's a, a number of, I think, for, for a lot of the attendees there, it, uh, you know, you start on Friday at five o'clock or four thirty around then, and and then you know starts early in the next morning, and uh, goes till about five five thirty. It gets to be information overload, so hopefully you can go back and digest all that, and, mm-hmm. and see if they're going to listen to anyone there, mainly us. So, what, do you want to get to the show? Should we? Sure. What do, do you it. think? Oh, great. I'm, I'm gonna, I was going to take a snippet, just a couple slides that I presented at the event and just go through them here today. All right. I'm going to talk about a small subsection of my talk at the World Outlook. I look back at 2022, essentially, um, and the market collapse, citing high valuations is one of my reasons why the market dropped. Now, here's a brief snippet from that section, including where the markets sit today in terms of valuations historically. So this was my second point as to why North American markets moved sharply lower in 2022. I talked about sky high valuations, and it's something I don't see referenced quite enough as a reason for the declines that we saw over the course of 2022. It's a drum that we've been beating for several years now. It has been difficult for us to find what we call growth at a reasonable price or GARP for nearly three three years. Now, we're starting to approach some better times in this regard, but with the rally to start this year, you know, patience may be key. This is when real money can start to be made in a well-positioned portfolio. Now, let's look at the current valuations. One metric we like to use is called the Schiller PE. Why? Because it's a more reasonable market valuation indicator than the regular PE. because It kind of eliminates the fluctuations of the ratio caused by variations of profit margins, during a business cycle as they come. So let's look at where we are today. This is the Schiller PE over the past 20 years. The ratio reached its highest point right here in November of 2021 in the range of 38.6, which would be about a 48% uh, above the average PE of the last 20 years, which is around 26. This was the highest ratio in the past 20 years. And then this is the 100 year plus chart of the Schiller PE. And this point was eclipsed literally only once since it's being tracked. And that was right here in the dot-com madness in 1999. And that was roughly around 44. So the question becomes, what I can show you is, you can see where we are there, kind of 30.3. But where are we historically today in terms of valuations? Well, the Schiller PE is now 30.3. Contextually, where is that? 
it's about 16.7% higher than the recent 20 year average of 26.1. Now this is far better than the range of 38 that it hit in uh, November this past year, which is about 48% above the PE, PE of the last 20 years. Now, I would say, however, it is very instructive to point out that the Schiller PE is still 75% above its all-time high of 17.3, indicating we are not nearly historically cheap in the markets. I would say current valuations broadly are superior to any period in the last two to four years outside of the pandemic flash crash, but risk remains elevated. I'll close by saying, how did we reach these levels of insanity last year in terms of valuations? Well, we really don't have enough time to go into that and drill down on the exact how, but I would start by saying a combination of easy money, extended poor government and federal bank policies, and a lack of focus on valuations. This all brought on FOMO or fear of missing out and speculative excesses in the market. Now, one of my themes, though, was to look on the bright side in this presentation. And fortunately, as I pointed out throughout my talk in Canada, we do have some great minds to solve all of our problems, including this gem who's on the task right now. And for her, those who are not uh, watching this on video, this is a image of uh, Justin Trudeau deep in thought. He's saying, bread goes in, toast comes out, but where does the bread go? Now, just as soon as he solves this very puzzling, puzzling toast issue, he's going to be all over solving all our economic problems. Yeah, your presentation sure got a lot of laughs in the crowd. There was a, there was many other jokes that you uh, you put in there, and I mean, it obviously, it was educational as well. You weren't just up there. Yeah, you got to give the information. But like I said, at that point in the day, we presented two thirty. Um, everybody's gone through hours and hours of uh, raw data, charts on charts on charts. Um, give really good information. We recommended four companies. Aaron had about five in there. Um, but also, you know, have a little levity in there so people can have a laugh at that point in the day when they're, they're going a little nuts. It's always okay. good to be able to do that. And, you know, Michael always, he told me years ago, uh, we're in the financial business first and foremost. You want to do all the analysis, but when you're doing a talk, it's also financial entertainment or something. But Finn Entertainment is his yeah. book. So it stuck with me to try to, introduce some of that into well i guess one way of looking at it too is that if nobody's awake they can't absorb any of the quality content so every once it's in a while you have it to do something true. that just kind of you know captures you have to trust. snap them to yeah. attention oh yeah yeah anyways yeah on a valuation basis it is it is it is instructive to look at kind of the shiller p and look back at where we are you see a significant decline in the markets last year probably at the start of the year came back to like an average valuation uh, over the past 20 years, not over the past hundred plus years though. It was still well above, uh, but um, over the past 20 years average. And then, you know, with it start the NASDAQ, for example, up 13 and a half percent, 14% to start the year after down 33 plus percent last year, uh, you know, the valuations, the broader index is a, just above almost 17% above, it's a 20 year average. So it's definitely something to watch in the face of declining to, to maybe flat earnings in some segments. This year. Well, we went through a period. So do we want to move any more comments the, or do we want to move on? Yeah, I'm making a comment right Pardon? now. I'm making a comment right now. Let's just move on. <laughs> we went through a period, at least in the tech sector, that uh, a lot of people just thought that valuation didn't matter. And that's largely why we've seen such catastrophic losses in, in, in technology. So yeah. a couple of the points that I made is, is if you look at companies like Zoom, um, DocuSign, some others as well, really popular companies during the pandemic, SaaS businesses, generally good companies, but you know some of these companies trading upwards of 100 times revenue. And we consider 100 times earnings to be extremely expensive, but 100 times revenue is, is ridiculous. And that's why many of these companies, in spite of being leaders in one of the highest growth sectors or the highest growth sector long term um, are down 80 90 percent in some cases from their from their highs so um, and still not really really cheap even afterwards um, really just coming back down to what we consider to be more of a an average valuation after a 90 percent drop so and like you said there, it is nice to see from us earnings mattering. Once again, people actually paying attention to that because you raised earnings, uh, you know, 18 months ago and 
What? No, no, it's not. You know, it's price to sales, price to. Oh, I mean, so, in some cases, sales. people think earnings are actually bad because they make it real. It's better to just use your imagination, yeah, right? right? Yeah. You know, and just yeah, to reiterate that one comment that, you know, Peter Lynch had made, thanks to the internet, 500 times earnings has lost its shock value and so has 50 times earnings. You know, so we're starting to see that kind of come back down to earth. I mean, he's obviously referencing the dot com mm -hmm. bubble. Um, but, you know, we kind of saw the same thing over 2021 and 2020. Yeah. Yeah. And that, the, it, it was, I remember back in that bubble, it was literally insane. You, you know, pets.com, you, you had companies, they put dot com after their name and they were going up 500, 800,000 uh, percent. You know, it's yeah. the blue sky potential of the Internet just, you know, drove a euphoria. But there, you know, there's we saw very, very significant speculative excess. Uh, in the tech center yep. uh, sector again during, you know, post pandemic, uh, Aaron talks about like hundreds of times, hundreds of times sales. That is absolute speculative success. Yeah. All right. Let's Brennan, you're going to hit the mailbag, right? I mean, sure you're am. looking forward to your month of love. <laughs> the, I mean, you're wearing is a red suit. suit. Isn't that, isn't that this appropriate? Is, is that a new it's suit, Brennan? Burgundy there. <laughs> Um, I have wore it once on the podcast before, oh, I but think I remember, uh, to actually. be completely honest, I need to get it a little hemmed. Mm. So, uh, it didn't make an appearance at the conference. So it's, it's strictly mm. a podcast suit right now. Uh, but yeah. So it's can I, the can month I... of love though. <laughs> yeah. Can, can we, can we move on from the month of love? Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. I was going to say right. that. So. You're going to talk about Atlas engineered products, AEP on the TSX venture, profitable, growing small cap. We've interviewed management. Uh, you know, the val have. valuations and uh, growth right now, they look good. You bet. So we got this question come in from Rex via email um, on the company. So Atlas Engineered Products, AEP on the TSX Venture, it currently trades at a price of about 93 cents and a market cap of about $53 million. So Atlas Engineered Products designs, manufactures and sells engineered roof trusses, floor trusses and wall panels. The company also distributes a range of various engineered wood products for use by builders of residential and commercial wood framed buildings. So the company's strategy is focused on profitability and organic revenue growth within its current markets and the pursuit of a roll up acquisition strategy to consolidate similar companies operating in the truss and engineered wood products industry across Canada. So um, we can see here uh, the company has made seven acquisitions since going public in 2017 with the most recent acquisition on February 28th of 2022 when Atlas acquired High Tech, which was located uh, on Vancouver Island, which manufactures roof trusses and sells engineered wood products. And the shares of High Tech were acquired for $5.8 in cash plus a working capital adjustment of about 500,000 and the land and buildings of high tech were also acquired by the company for the appraised value of 3.25 million in cash. Uh, and Atlas financed that the high tech acquisition with a term loan for 5.8 million, as well as a mortgage for 2.4 million. So we do see that debt hitting the balance sheet. Uh, and during the 2021 fiscal year, high tech earned revenues of just over 5 million net income before taxes of just over 1 million and normalized EBITDA of 1.25 million uh, with an EBITDA margin of about 25%. So looking at the recent financials over the last eight quarters here, and specifically looking at the last quarter, uh, revenue growth was relatively flat coming in at 17.6 million. Adjusted EBITDA was 5.2 million up 12.6% from 4.6 million in Q3 of 2021. And net income increased 12.1% uh, to 3.1 million or 5 cents per share compared to net income of 2.8 million or 5 cents per share for Q3 of 2021. And the increase in adjusted EBITDA and net earnings was primarily due to the increase in revenues, uh, improvements in gross margin and the new acquisition of high tech. Looking at the balance sheet, they had about 12.9 million uh, in cash with uh, 15.9 million in debt and leases, providing a net debt position of about $3 million. And the balance sheet is very healthy with a net debt to EBITDA multiple well under one times. And right now we are seeing the company trade at about 6.2 times earnings, which is attractive. So moving on, um, as Ryan said, we did speak with management. Uh, we had a call with Hattie, the CEO 
uh, who founded Atlas. Uh, and this call was just over a year ago in December of 2021. And something that Ryan has taught me to ask just kind of at the end of a lot of calls is, you know, just an overhanging question. What can derail the story into 2022? Because we were in December of 2021 at the time. And he said, if developers shut the lights off and if interest rates increase above 4%, it would affect them. And he went on to say, money is so cheap right now. And considering when we had this call, interest rates were at just 0.3%. And look at where we've seen them go over 2022, above that 4%, which he kind of warned about. So to conclude, I like Atlas Engineered Products as a business, and the stock has done very well over the last two years. The CEO seems like a straight shooter. The company maintains a healthy balance sheet. It trades with low valuations and has been acquiring accretive businesses. But my overhanging fear with the story are the comments from the CEO during our call just over a year ago when he said, Money was very cheap, and if interest rates go above 4%, it could potentially disrupt the business's growth. So with this potentially disrupting the growth plant path in the near term, we would remain on the sidelines at this moment in time. It's an interesting company. It yeah. could be worth another call with the CEOs just to see how, what the... Uh... Totally. What business looks like or if there's been much of an effect is certainly, I mean, developers, I don't think have turned off the lights, but then a lot of projects, they get started... Yeah you know, well in advance. So you have to finish them. And it'd be, I'd, I'd be interested to see his, hear about his outlook going mm -hmm. forward at this point. Totally. Yeah. For us, it would be uh, a cyclical industry. Like they are in a cyclical, in a cyclical industry. It does follow like building patterns and um, with higher interest rates, is there the worry that you, know, you have a slowdown and, and, you know, that's what he talked about. So, and it was hard to give guidance in that respect. So, uh, you know, for us, the earnings have been great. The valuations right now look good. Uh, there is some debt there that they've used to, to um, yeah. you know, finance the acquisitions, which, you know, again, and debt is more costly now than when, you know, they originally started to make these acquisitions. So, you know, it's the question is, can the growth by acquisition continue potentially, mm -hmm. but can the growth in the market is the end market is there going to be organic growth in this type of environment and those would be the questions that uh, the next time we talk yep. to the ceo that's what we'll be talking about you bet all right let's move on to uh aaron aaron's gonna be doing an educational segment on ebitda versus net income yeah that's right so uh, this is actually um inspired by one of the attendees at the, at the conference who's also a client and a podcast listener so he, I can't remember his name, but he had mentioned that we talk a lot about earnings. We talk a lot about EBITDA and he just wanted to get a sense of, you know, what was the, what was the difference or, or rather which one should he pay attention to more? Um, so I thought that was a good, I thought that was a good topic. And I figured, uh, I promised him that we would make it a segment on the, on the podcast. And, and here we go, EBITDA versus earnings for financial analysis. So uh, it is correct. Um, we do discuss EBITDA fairly, fairly regularly, as well as, of course, net earnings. Um, our, our primary focus is on profitability of a company. If a company is not profitable, we won't, we won't recommend it. Um, so profitability is, is the minimum criteria. And that really just comes down to a business being a really validated, the company actually being a validated business. Like, are you actually able to sell your products and services? Are you able to do this profitably? And we want to see that track record. But um, what what is EBITDA? So EBITDA is is a term that you know probably a lot of people don't understand. It's a little more a little more esoteric if you're not uh, if you're not you know in the investment industry or or you don't do research on your own. But what it means is this is this is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So you, you essentially, you would take your revenues, you would extract, you would take away all of the operating expenses, um, like the cost of goods sold, um, you know, rent for any buildings or properties, um, general selling and administrative expenses, that kind of thing. Um, and that would essentially get you to your EBITDA. Now, the main difference between EBITDA and operating earnings is that EBITDA is before depreciation and amortization. And what this is, is this is just an estimate that the company makes in terms of um, how much the value of their, their property, plant, and equipment is declining on a yearly basis, right? So you make a big investment, say in some equipment, 
Um, you know, maybe you spend $10 million on that equipment. Um, it's a one-time cost for the most part. Um, but you know, that equipment may only have a useful life of 10 years. So every year they have to take a charge in terms of what they think the, the decline in value of that equipment is, because one day you're going to have to uh, replace it. And then that charge goes against, um, goes against earnings. But in this case, it, it does not count for EBITDA. Um, so EBITDA does not consider depreciation and amortization because it's not an actual cash cost in that given year. And it's also based on an estimate that the company makes. So really what EBITDA is, is it's a measure of a company's operational profitability. Um, you know, you're not considering the, the interest expense. You're not considering the, the income tax expense or the depreciation. You're just looking at, you know, the, the operating profitability of the business um, before things that management can control in terms of how much debt they have or what their estimates are for depreciation. And, um, and then of course, taxes, which is not something that is really operational. It's a cost, of course, you have to incur, but it's not really, it's not really considered an operational cost. So when you're evaluating a company's operating performance, particularly when you're comparing the company to other companies in the industry, um, it's often a good idea to use EBITDA um, just because, you know, different companies will have different capital structures, different level of debt, interest payments, sometimes different tax expense as well. You might have some some carry forwards from previous years. You may make some different assumptions and estimates when it comes to depreciation. Um, but EBITDA kind of strips all of that out so you can just look at that operating profitability. Whereas net earnings is, is the very bottom line. And this is the profitability after all of the expenses. So this would include charges for depreciation. It would include interest expense. It would include taxes, essentially everything. And really theoretically, what net earnings is supposed to be, is it supposed to be the profitability that is available for the shareholders after all of the expenses. Now, that's not necessarily in practice totally true. There are a lot of accounting estimates and things that often go into net earnings. Um, we've talked about this on previous podcasts that a lot of times net earnings aren't a good rep representation of what the actual profitability, the real economic profitability is. But that's essentially what it's it's supposed to be. And for some companies, net earnings can be very clean and reliable. For others, you have to make a lot of adjustments or even just, you know, go somewhere else and look for the look at the cash flow. But, you know, really net earnings is this is you're evaluating the company's overall financial performance for investors. Um, and this is, you know, commonly used when making an investment decision in terms of how profitable a company is. It's including the operating considerations and then also the financing and the taxation considerations as well. Um, but really, you know, EBITDA and price to earnings, they're used a lot in, they're used a lot to compare companies in terms of like how profitable they are, but also they're used in valuation. So how expensive is a business relative to its profitability? And for EBITDA, what you would use is you use uh, an enterprise value or EB to EBITDA ratio. So enterprise value, um, this is essentially the value of the company when you also consider the debt and the cash, right? So most of the time when you look at a company, like for example, if you were to buy a company and the company were to sell itself to you for, you know, $1 million, a lot of people would say, well, you know, you bought a company for $1 million, but that's not necessarily exactly true because what if the company has $10 million in debt? Well, then you're responsible for that debt. So you paid $1 million plus the 10 million you owe, you actually paid $11 million for the company. So, um, you know, using an EV to EBITDA ratio, it really helps to kind of normalize companies that have very different capital structures because you could have company A that has no debt um, and a lot of cash, and that's a completely different capital structure than company B that has um, a lot of debt and very little cash, right? So you, you essentially, EV enterprise value is the market value of the company plus the net debt. Um, and that is really, you know, if you were to buy the entire company, um, that is really what the the value of the company, really what you're paying, not just the price you pay, but also the debt you, you incur. So EV to EBITDA is often used um, when, when companies are doing acquisitions. That's one of the metrics used. Um, price to earnings does not consider the capital structure really at all. Um, different capital structures will have different interest expense and that will affect in some ways taxation. So it does get uh, it, it does get factored in there in a way, but you know, when you're doing a price to earnings, you're just looking at the share price or you're just looking at the market valuation. You're not considering the debt. Um, so this can be misleading, right? Because 
companies with a lot of debt, um, they can essentially drive in many cases um, higher earnings by using by using financial leverage, right? But that comes at a risk that they have higher interest expense um, and they they you know have more debt. So there's just there's more financial risk. So if you you, you could have two companies that have the same price to earnings ratio, but one can have a lot of debt uh, and the other can have no debt or even net cash. And that's a very different situation. So just looking at the price to earnings ratio doesn't necessarily tell you anything more about the business. But you know, ultimately, one way to look at the, the price to earnings ratio is that you're, it's, it's how much you're paying for every dollar of earnings. Uh, and then you have to determine what you think a dollar of earnings is worth. If a company is riddled with debt, or it's in a declining industry, or it has other risks, then a dollar of earnings should be worth less than a company that has very little debt or, you know, net cash or um, it, that, that is in a growth industry or just in a really uh, better, better position. So um, price to earnings will tell you how much you're paying for every dollar of earnings. It will not tell you how much you should be paying for every dollars, dollar of earnings, right? So that they, there are two ratios that kind of tell you two different things. Um, but just in conclusion, I know a lot of this can be confusing to people. And um, so I just want to basically kind of sum it up and make it simple. You know, net earnings and earnings per share, generally, this is going to be the more relevant metric to an investor. As a common stock investor, somebody buying stock in the stock market, it's really the net earnings and the earnings per share that we care about. Um, and we're going to assume that those earnings are right now an accurate representation. If they're not, then we have to understand that as analysts. We have to make certain adjustments. Sometimes we go more, we look more closely at the cash flow than the earnings, but you can have a pretty good idea of how messy the earnings are or not if um, when you're looking at the financial statement. So that's part of being an analyst is just determining, can we rely on these earnings? But ultimately, net earnings is the profitability that goes to the investor. So that is the more relevant um, metric. EBITDA, you don't pay dividends with EBITDA. Um, you, you don't buy back shares with EBITDA. You, you, you do that with cash flow and earnings is supposed to represent the cash flow available for those things. That said, um, when earnings are messing, messy, sometimes EBITDA is a very convenient ratio to look at because it's less fluctuative. You can compare companies with different capital structures. There's less earnings is lower on the income statement, which means there's a lot of other uh, line items that get in the way, some of which um, are, are relevant and some of which aren't. Um, so, you know, EBITDA is also a good metric to look at. And the fact of the matter, and this is the same for other metrics as well, like operating cash flow, free cash flow, it, you don't have to just use one. So when we talk about EBITDA or we talk about net earnings, it doesn't mean we're not looking at other metrics as well. It's just, especially on the podcast, when we're going over a company, we typically want to do that in a couple of minutes. So it can't be an extremely comprehensive analysis of that company, but you know, if we're talking about EBITDA of a company, you can be sure that we're also looking at the net earnings or the cash flow and the free cash flow as well. Um, you really want to look at a lot of different things, a lot of different metrics, because each one tells a different story and it doesn't have to be just one. Um, you really use a lot of them in an analysis. But for the most part, if somebody were to ask me as an investor, what is more important to me, um, it would be the net earnings because that is supposed to be what you are investing in as, as an investor. Um, so that's good. That's uh, that concludes the breakdown. I hope it wasn't too too confusing. No, it's a good summary, and, and it, that's it the thing just with goes... just you know EBITDA is depreciation and amortization. Again, their account, their you know accounting adjustments. You know, again, it all comes down to you know what management and what you know. Um, I guess estimates they're using to depreciate, you know, their assets. It really depends. And, and that's where, you know, it's our jobs as analysts to see if they're actually doing a fair representation of, you know, depreciating their assets over, you know, a fair life of, you know, an asset or one. And if you look at it from a tax perspective, and this isn't, this is different than the depreciation on a financial statement. It's actually in management's they're incentivized to overstate depreciation because then they pay less tax yeah. because that's an expense. Keep but the, the, the tax company. authorities yeah. have completely different rules when it comes to depreciation. And that has nothing to do with what's reported on the, the financial statements. The, the, in Canada, the CRA and the US, the IRS, they will have their own rules 
Um, and then the depreciation that is reported on the financial statement will be different. But some would say for a financial statement, a lot of companies would be incentivized to understate uh, depreciation because um, that would inflate their earnings. So it's, um, you know, it's as, as I said, you can't just look at one thing. You're not just looking at the earnings. You're looking at a, you're looking at the earnings in the context of everything else, the operating earnings, the EBITDA, the gross profit margins, you know, the, the capital structure of the business, the earnings quality, how much of, how much of those earnings are actually converting into cash flow, um, and then other items as well. So. Yeah. And then it's individual to each business. Is it a software company? Mm -hmm. Is it a manufacturing company? Right. Yep. All of these things. We, we wish we could just give you, you know, this is the way you look at every company and that's it. You know, it's so it's simple. But then so would we be analysis is individual. Yeah. Analysis is an individual or is individual to the company or the industry often as well. Mm -hmm. So there's all those things will factor in, but that was a really good summary. And I think it'll answer a lot of questions. So I hope thank it you for that. And if it didn't let us know, yeah, for I'll sure. do another one. Yeah. <laughs> Rip into him. <laughs> or he'll just leave. I'm done. That's what he said. I did enough. That was good. Uh, finally, Brett's going to give us a summary. Or did anybody else have any comments on that? Or we're good? We're good? We're no, good. We're I, can, good. We I can quickly add something, actually. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, no. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, cut me off as usual. That's that's what Brian likes to do. <laughs> but um, so EBITDA, the act companies won't always actually give you. So it normally will require a bit more work. And other times I'll actually provide adjusted EBITDA, which would do a bit more than your interest, your tax and depreciation. So they'll remove things like they'll actually add back stock compensation, which we don't like. Lots of the times they'll over add, they'll be um, doing a ton of stock compensation. And they'll add that back to adjusted EBITDA in this case, which can really inflate it. Other things they will do is uh acquisition expenses which are one off so you are getting back to that truer uh, operational which is the point of EBITDA um they'll do foreign exchange stuff like that so you really need to pay attention to what EBITDA they're actually giving you because it's a non-standard uh, metric it's a yeah. non-gap metric versus earnings a lot of times they'll they'll give you a gap and then if they adjust it which they have to give you the gap which is a uh, general accounting um what is it? I'm forgetting the actual generally acronym. accepted accounting, accepted accounting pr principle. principles. Thank you. Yes, I, I should know that. <laughs> so we're, we're um, IFRS now, yeah. actually, but yeah, the U.S. Yeah. is gap. Yeah, we're yeah. We're IFRS. We were so gap. Now we're really confused. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Forget it's all these acronyms. Finance, but a bunch of an acronyms, acronyms right? reporting right? standards, but it's all they're, they're standards, basically yes. just the, the 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 accounting standards. And yeah, to your point, EBITDA yeah, what, is not. Point, you can calculate EBITDA technically any way you want. Yes. Um, that yeah. that's that's what Brett was yeah. saying. That's that's point. exactly my point. He, and adjusted yes. EBITDA, you can calculate it any way you want. And I've I mean I've seen mm -hmm. some calculations almost so egregious where companies were like, well, we had a bad quarter, yeah. but if we had a good quarter, and then adjusted EBITDA would have been this. So it just it's it's exactly. important more than just the metric. It's important to know what goes into the metric. What was it made up exactly. of? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like e even if I could extend the point, like for acquisition expenses, if a company is regularly making acquisitions, you know, as a part yeah. of their core growth strategy, you know, that might be questionable if they are adjusting out these. Yeah, a lot, a lot of companies will pull that out all the time, and and yeah. they have a ten year track record of you know acquiring thirty companies, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it, 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 that is definitely part of your business, and it's part of the business. You know, I get what they're trying to do, but it's you know, it's, it's if that is your um, that your modus operandi, I don't know if it's good. Well, and again, you you want to look at both, right? Like on one hand, you could make the argument you can look at it both investment. ways, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think you need you can't ignore it. You need, I mean, it's well, and it's the same as Brett said about yeah. the share stock based compensation. You know, if if you you can look at you look at both metrics you look at that with and without stock based compensation if the difference is minimal uh, maybe it's not worth spending a lot of time worrying about but if the difference is pretty significant as we have seen in the technology software space you can't just ignore it you don't want to yeah. just ignore it <laughs> yeah if a company's getting a premium multiple and they're adjusting out that acquisition cost you want to see how premium it really is without that, because if the acquisitions are a big part of their growth, you know, if somehow that is removed, then you, you really don't want them trading at a massive premium. So there's, and again, that comes down to individual for each company, the industry and what they're yep. doing. So well, not one size fits all, but I think Aaron's overall point is really uh, well, it should be well taken. 
Yep. Now, Brett's going to finally give us a summary of the trouble facing the now former third richest man in the world, Gautam Adani, and his companies, the Adani Group, which have been accused of fraud by the short seller Hindenburg Group, or research Hindenburg Research, essentially. Um, do you want to go? You want to start that, Brett? Yeah. All right. So the now former after so that it it's actually collapsed quite a bit. So uh, he was the third richest man. Gautam mm-hmm. Adani and his companies is a, was originally, yes, <laughs> um, a family-owned business, but it since went public many, many years ago. The Adani Group, it's uh, effectively seven core companies, which I'm going to be looking at, has been accused of fraud, amongst other things, by the short-selling group Indenberg Research. So sometimes short-selling research, uh, they obviously have uh, monetary, uh, well, what should I say? Uh, Incentive. Incentives. Yeah. Thank you, Brennan. Yeah. I'm yep. just forgetting words today. It was a long weekend. Uh, and yeah. so you have to really question if the research is just uh, sensational or is it actually bound to uh, some fundamentals or is it fraud in this case? So you really want to look deeper than just it was fraud. It was this blah, blah, blah. So the Indian based group headed by Gautam Adani is comprised of seven core companies, Adani Enterprises, Adani Transmission, Adani Total Gas, Adani Green Energy, Adani Power, and Adani Ports, and then and Adani Wilmar, two of which are in the India's Nifty 50 Index, and six are in the MSCI India Index. These are quite commonly used indexes. So if uh, you own, let's say, an emerging fund or any uh, India-based ETF or fund, there's a high probability that these companies are in them and you indirectly hold them. So there's your uh, state on why you shouldn't always buy ETFs because you can't actually get these companies, even though they are a very small percentage. The couple I looked at, they were 0.2% of the ETFs, but you do still own them. So on the date of this report, which it was released on January 24th, the Adani Groups, those seven companies, was valued at 218 billion US and has since fallen over 50% at the time of our recording to 106 billion. As short seller reports commonly do, and this report is no different, they provide a huge amount of reasons of why the company is overvalued, or in this case, fraudulent as well. Before we get to the fraud, Hindenburg first states the company are purely overvalued based on pricing valuations, which is what we do. We are inclined to agree with this as well, because as Aaron was actually saying in our previous segment, um, or sorry, Brennan was saying in his previous segment that high earning multiples when you're looking past 100 and in this case a few of the companies were at 800 price to earning multiples yes 800 another one was at 300 another one that was around 80 and so on like that they're not cheap companies for the most part and when you were comparing to the industry averages what hindenburg did they were 80 90 plus percent overvalued on that one metric as well as they cited liquidity concerns due to high debt but let's look into some fraud because Really, these overvalued companies, they're nothing unique. We go over them all the time, and we've seen them even quite recently with what Aaron was saying earlier. That's where Aaron was coming in on this with the, the tech companies over the past few years. So, And I'll, I'll link the full Hindenburg report as well as the Downey's response. They are extremely long, I will say. So just a warning, the, Hin- the Downey response is over 400 pages, to give you an idea. First off, the biggest claim I'm, I'm going to go over the Uh, bigger claims and the stronger ones that I saw, but there are many more, of course. So the first claim I'll go through is that Adani's group insider ownership is just too high. For India, a public company has to have a maximum of 50 or 75% insider ownership. Hindenburg claims that Adani is in excess of 75% using shell companies and or funds. And Mauritius, which is a tiny little island, well, no, I shouldn't say tiny, it's about a million point two population off the southeast coast of Africa, but it's a co- it's a country that is commonly used as a tax haven. So it's not exactly surprising to see funds in this location, but it's surprising how many funds and how much ownership is within this country. So, and the issue with, with these funds is they almost exclusively own Adani companies. So they should be classified as what Hindenburg is saying as promoters or insiders, which will push the insider ownership past this legal threshold. And obviously, The issue is when you have this high of insider ownership, you can have stock price manipulation and they can significantly impact liquidity. So if they're doing a raise, which is actually what they were doing and have now canceled, is you shoot up the valuation by buying up the stock because it's on very low liquidity. And then right after it's issued, you can take it back down and reclaim your money, but you sold at a higher value. And 
this is contrary to what we'll commonly say is we like insider ownership, but this is just too high. We want to see a bit of insider ownership, but not obviously this high or illegal ownership in many in this alleged case, I will say. So a damage response in their 413 page response is uh, they're not related to these companies. They, they have nothing to do with them, so they don't, they're not going to comment on it. That's their response. So it's a pretty weak response, in my opinion. Second point I'll go over is Hindenburg accuses Vin Adani, Gutam Sadamni's brother, of heading a shell company structure, so multiple shell companies, to uh, obscure inflow and outflow of capital into Adani Group, allowing the Adani Group to boost reported earnings as well as move money around as they need. So if they need money for a fund, they can move it out of one into another. And these companies really shouldn't be doing this. This is illegal. I, I don't know the Indian regulations well, but I'm going to assume it's illegal. Uh, but it, I know it is in Canada to do it under this uh, function. So they'll use this other, another method is they're using it to actually extract funds into the Danny family, private owned funds and uh, firms, so these shell companies, and then use that to produce wealth for themselves, pretty much. Adani's response is they were uh, at arm's length. So that means they were legal to do, but obviously Hindenburg disagrees. And they say, claim that these were done at fair value, which is what you're meant to do for these um, related firms' transactions. But uh, you're, you are allowed to operate within your own like uh, group's uh, company structure and you are allowed to do transactions with one another, but they have to be a fair value. They have to be reasonable, especially when you're dealing with public companies. But the claim obviously is they're not. And they, Adani just dismisses and say, Hey, we're, we're we don't have to control these private companies. It's not our business. The third major point I'll go through is in connection to the Indian government and taxpayers fund. The group has been accused of import export scams multiple times and they've been through the court systems. Number excited four cases of which the group claim, uh, would inflate values of exports to obtain tax credits in one of these cases from hitting export quotas. So they inflate, let's say, they're exporting iron ore, which is what the enterprise, uh, Adani Enterprises does, is they export, let's say, what would be a fair value of $70 per ton of iron ore, whatever it happens to be, up to 100 There you go. You hit your export quota and you're getting some tax credits back, as well as citing multiple cases where they have been accused and have been in the court system for paying bribes to multiple levels of government to illegally export items. The Adani's group response is this was settled in court and they were found to be false. So more dismissive. There have been since some protests calling for action of state investments into the Adani group. So there has been some state funds, well, Indian state, I should say, funds into the Adani group. And since as well, there's been circuit limits imposed. So that's how much the stock can go up or down. If you look at some of the stocks, you'll just see it's a flat line all day. It is actually trading. It's not halted. It's just no one wants to buy for more than that value. So it just drives up liquidity. And it was first 20%, then 10%. And it's now five for some of these companies. And it's just a flat line for some of the days. And it's actually quite interesting. But uh, yeah, I'll open up if you guys had any comments. I was just doing a little bit of um, of research on Hindenburg Research, so I don't, <laughs> um, I don't, I'm not familiar with the short selling company myself. Um, I do know that uh, we, you know, we've seen various periods of the market in the market in the past where there seems to be a lot of short selling activity, and generally, what I've seen in the past is um, these these short selling companies come out. Some of them known, some of them fairly unknown. And they they put together these huge reports, many of which look like they're put together by children. Um, you'll see cartoons, you'll see like a lot of claims that are just non-falsifiable. And the idea is that you create a scare, drive the stock price down, and then they cover their short, they make money. Um, so we've seen this in the past. I didn't read through the whole Hindenburg, Hindenburg report. I didn't get that impression. I mean, it didn't look to me like it was, I mean, some of the reports that I've seen were just kind of laughable from the perspective of an analyst reports I've seen in the past. Um, from what I just looked at in the, in the Hindenburg report, I mean, it, it looked like looked like it was professionally written. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. Just like the reports that look like they're unprofessionally written aren't necessarily wrong. Um, so one thing that I did uh, notice is, though, is that Hindenburg research, one of the other big companies that they went after was a company called Nikola. Um, which was they I, they were doing electric vehicles. I believe they were doing electric trucks. 
And this is a company that really popped out to me years ago before the short report, because they had a market cap of oh, many, like tens of billions of dollars. I can't remember exactly what it was, um, but they had zero revenue. Um, so this reminded me of like a full tech bubble style company. I mean, even in the recent boom in the tech market, we saw where I'm talking about companies trading at a hundred times revenue, they still had revenue, right? Um, whereas, you know, I remember looking at Nickel and being, and thinking, I, I want to say that it was a 60 billion market cap company at one point with no revenue, but that seemed absolutely insane to me. So that's one of the companies that this Hindenburg went after. Um, you know, I don't know much about them. I was never going to invest in any of these companies. I think that, that, that they're talking about in the short report anyways, but it, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I feel I see less of that short selling activity than I have in the past, but when it does come, I mean, it's, it, it creates a scare. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think in this specific case, um, it was a, you know, for this company, it's probably a good bet. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and then like Brett pointed out the scenario, essentially you have a company trading and the group of companies trading at huge, massive valuations. They're funded by, I think, $30 billion approximately in debt. That's one of the most indebted groups or companies in mm -hmm. India. And this is, again, at the time when debt servicing costs have risen significantly. Uh, if you can impact a company's ability to access funding in some way, you inhibit growth with less growth, uh, not so fast. You know, multiples will shrink over time. So even if the fraud alleged is false, um, it's a decent bet on a company that was probably or a group of companies that was really quite overvalued. So, you know, if you're going to pick a company, you know, pick that lineup in that scenario, um, even if you're completely false on all the act and, and uh, a allegations, which may or very may complicated be entity as well. Right. I mean, just so yes. many moving parts. Yeah. It's, it's hard to know. Oh, it's great when you have on. that yes. for these yes. type of reports. Yeah. Right. For sure. But I mean, I've seen yeah. reports, short reports come out on companies and they've turned out to be absolutely true. I've seen other ones that were just, they were just fishing expeditions, right? Um, yeah. So. yeah. Well, some you're looking for an initial pop yeah. downwards, take your money and yeah. go out. That's probably not the firms that I would follow. Um, if you're, you know, if you're actually trying to root out fraud um, and you found it, um, you know, it's, 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 it is part of the market that, I mean, you can have somebody digging out fraud. Why not have that? Mm -hmm. if, if fraud is discovered. Well, absolutely. I mean, out, if they're actually doing good, good quality research and then making money off a of short, yeah. I think that's that's great. Um, a lot of the shorting companies yeah. that I've seen in the past are not doing quality research. Some I'm sure are. No, that's and that's, that's a public service. On either side, if you're doing good quality research, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's good for the markets. Yeah. If you're not, I mean, you're part, part of the of problem. problem. So. Yeah. That, that's and that's the say. thing with, you know, a short report, like making sure that you are seeing like, you know, the company behind the short report, um, like who's actually issuing the report itself, because, you know, that's the yeah. thing with the internet in this day and age is anybody could go out there and write or publish any kind of report. And that's happened. Um, you know, it does look like anonymous sources. Well. Exactly. Yeah. Completely with Hinderberg, we know the founder. There's exactly. It's not an anonymous. I mean, the people I know very it. little about exactly. the company. Yeah. I can say that I agree certainly on their report on Nicola. Um, I don't know why that even needs a short report, but uh, I would, I, I would a hundred percent agree with them on that. Um, but I, yeah. You think there should have been more during the, 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 the bobble up, you yeah, know, that yeah. we just saw in the markets, because I mean, I mean, if you're trying to root out fraud, it's not necessarily that some of those companies are fraud, but that, that's where you say are many of them looking for just overvalued, overvalued situations mm -hmm. because there were certainly, like it should have been a kid in a candy store a year, a year ago. Yeah. But shorting's a you different know, game again, too. you know, it's yeah, different. both sides of the, if, if you're doing good research, either way, it's helpful to the markets. So that's For sure. what we'd say yeah. on that. We'll see totally. uh, if this ends up being true, but certainly a good target to go after if you're hedging that way uh, at this point. I think that's going to close out our show. It was great to see a, a ton of clients in Vancouver over the course of this weekend at the world outlook. Um, Keep your questions coming into our Your Stock, Our Take segment. Uh, smash that subscribe button if you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, keep your questions coming in even on the YouTube right below there. We'll answer those. Uh, if you're watching this or listening to this on iTunes, rate and review us there. And as always, I wish you profitable investing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.